Tony Barrett. So before we go into it, uh, explain what a statute is. Not that I don't know, but, uh, you know, for, for, for uh, everyone listening. Yeah, so a statute, there's this idea of natural law versus positive law. And a statute basically is a dictate of the legislature. It's positive law. It's something that's created by a body of people. And as opposed to natural law or the common law, which is law that comes about naturally through what people are just doing on their own, uh, it comes from custom. It also comes from um, what a circuit court is supposed to do. A trial court is supposed to find the law and find the law through working through problems and how people are solving them on their own le- on their own level and by themselves. So one is organic and one is unnatural. See, I think that's vitally important for us because we both correctly see houses and restaurants as private property. Why is it okay to just walk into one uh, and on the other you have to knock? Well, come on, you know the rules, you know what people want, you know how when they display something that would be a statute as opposed to, you know, something uh, or, or you might actually consider that. E- either way, it allows us to have sort of a different view and more of a conceptual idea of what is what's expected of human beings. You know, is it you went to the store, so now your house is mine since you didn't occupy it? No. Well, what if you don't go to your house for 500 years and then your family returns? Well, at some point in the middle, we can find an equilibrium. So thank you for that. Uh, mm-hmm. She just mentioned, I decided my passion for words was better suited to deciphering statutes than novels. So I want clarity on that. She says, when I went to college, it never occurred to me that anyone would consider girls to be less capable than boys. I thought that was really nice to hear because I don't hear the racism and the sexism in America that the left always claims is there. And they go, well, no questioning. It was there, you know, some time ago. Um, I was just, I just... I just get such a sigh of relief when I hear, you know, some high elected official or someone in a high position just say, hey, this SJW false division stuff, let's get rid of it. Uh, Do you have any thoughts on uh, either of those first two things about um, uh, just her uh, her personal remarks? Well, I think it was really funny because I was an English major in undergrad, too. I don't know if I was thinking about grad school for English, but I ended up turning towards the law as well. I also, I really, it is refreshing and I appreciate it that um, a woman wouldn't, you know, she wouldn't hang everything on that hook. She she just goes out and does it. You know what I mean? She doesn't expect accolades for it or anything, but she's just like, yeah, I'm here. Let's do the law. <laughs> Dude, yesterday I found out that the comedian Tim Dillon is gay and I couldn't believe it. I go, what? He's never mentioned it. I've listened to tens of hours of his hilarious podcast and it turns out he is and the 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 very first comment on the video where he talks about it was tim dylan is what happens when the most um, uh, when the most interesting thing about you isn't your gender or sexuality and i'm like that's right. a perfect way it's like yes. th- there's a reason amy coney barrett is very interesting to listen to comparatively to an SJW who, like, getting through a tweet, I have to you know, pause, take a sip. Uh, I get triggered at their triggering. <laughs> so it, it's just a loop of, you know, people being overly sensitive. So, yes, I really appreciate uh, that that from her. Yeah, you, you are so right. And I, I've put it this way, too, is that, you know, for my own self, when I was super duper into libertarianism all the time, I I thought I started to become the thing that I hated about SJWs is that they were always defined by their, you know, their sexuality or their race or something like that. And now I feel like I've reached a place where, you know, there's lots of different things about me. But specifically with, with Amy Coney Barrett, yes. The most interesting thing about her is definitely her judicial philosophy. I mean, it's also her family, you know, and her kids in that background and balancing being a mom with, but, but I guess that has to do with her gender, but I think it has more to do with her lifestyle. You know, like for instance, Tucker, Carl- Tucker Carlson, if you see a picture of him with his family, it is very clear that his family is very important to him. And that's a huge part of what he does. Um, 
So I, I enjoy that about Tucker, you know. There's that great meme. Tucker Carlson's family. Him and his whole family smiling and hugging. Don Lemon's family. Him and his boyfriend. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking of. And dude, th- th- that is so true. I fortunately have made sure that, uh, you know, I-, I really try to find a balance of, you know, not being defined by it, investing myself in the thing that I only am in to hate this other thing called the state. Dude, what a terrible place that uh, that, that, that that would be. So, we, we yeah, were, but very good that uh, we found that equilibrium. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would say I have, you know, um, but we're going to talk more about that in our next episode. I think we will talk about that. Okay. No, no spoilers. Okay. Yeah. She goes on. So she clerked for Justice Scalia. His judicial philosophy was straightforward. A judge must apply the law as written, not as the judge wishes it were. This really brings us into the uh, different views of the world that I mentioned previously. The constrained versus the unconstrained vision of, gosh, th- what I am dealing with is the combination of so many brilliant minds over so many centuries. This is what I should defer to. Even though I really think this is wrong, I should defer to that. That's certainly showing some humility. However, uh, once you're at that level, you should have the confidence to recognize that morality is objective. Because the question is, all right, uh, what was it? Dred Scott, you know, where they basically, you know, just enslaved a runaway. Um, you, I, you have to be willing to say that there are lines you can't cross. I thought that was extremely disappointing. And the fact that that wasn't mentioned at all, uh, you know, no real natural law foundation, no sense of objective morality. Uh, I got to say, I just hate that that's totally ignored. Thoughts on a judge must apply the law as written, not as the judge wishes it were. Yeah, there's there's a certain jurist who um, I know personally that. I really admire because she's able to do this. And I've discussed with her, you know, in my career, just that she, in the past, she's had to make decisions like this, where she, she kind of wants it to be a certain way, but she knows what the law is. And that's always foremost in her mind is what the law is and trying to make the correct call based on that. And I I think it's definitely, it's probably really hard to do. But one quality I think that judges have or they should have is they can't be afraid to make an unpopular decision. And that takes a lot of balls and you have to not give a crap what other people think. And I I think that's really hard. And it's the peer pressure too, not only trying to be an activist, but it is the peer pressure. And that pressure can be very hard or the fear of being embarrassed or the feel of, I mean, this is the same fear you probably have all experienced recently. Do I wear a mask in the grocery store or do I not? You know? Um, so I, I think that on one level, it's it's easy to be an armchair jurist and say, you know, this is what it should be. And I mean, it's easy to do that with everything. But to actually walk the walk, you know, that that's hard to do. And someone who can actually do that, I really appreciate. But um, There's another thing to get into here is this idea of an objective law in an objective morality, because I think that reasonable minds could differ about what that objective law is. And so we get into a lot of, I mean, this is a really deep topic that might warrant a whole other episode, but I tend to think more so that even though we believe that there is an objective law, I think reasonable minds could differ about how the NAP is applied. And on some level, too, I think that what we're looking for is a free market in the production of law itself. That being said, I could envision a society where certain cultures, the NAP would apply maybe differently. I'm I'm working this thought out as I'm speaking it right now. But do you, you understand what I'm getting at? Well, yeah, and you're completely right. I mean, let's just say we weren't all on the same page about the Kyle Rittenhouse. We're not all on the same page about abortion. And that's just anarcho-capitalist libertarians who are in my, you know, age group. So that's a really narrow demographic. If we can't all agree on something like that, you know, how do we get other people to? 
So the point is not to say there's complexity, so we can't have a free market. No, the fact that there is complexity is why you need the ability to have competition, the ability to opt out, and for people to know if I don't produce good law, people are going to go elsewhere. So yes, it is the production that increases the likelihood we will get the best desired results rather than because as I, you know, constantly say, every criticism you could have of voluntarily funded competition applies tenfold to a coercively funded monopoly. She goes on, sometimes that approach meant teaching, meant reaching results that he did not like, referring to Scalia. But as he put it in one of his best known opinions, that is what it means to say we have a government of laws, not of men. What are your thoughts on the term, we should be a nation of laws, not of men? Hmm. That's a pretty loaded statement, and I guess I, I don't really know what to say. Is that, oh, well, maybe it's the difference between uh, this common law and positive law. Uh, I think you could you could make that connection, is that we should be um, guided by, hmm, I guess maybe that doesn't fit. What do you think, Keith? I think it's a false dichotomy. I think it's the equivalent of saying, it's not Congress voting. This is the people. No, it's the Congress every time. Yeah. So when they say it's not a government of laws, it, or it's not a government of men, it's a government of laws. Give me a law that applies the same to two men. Let's start with something really simple. Don't give me this 72,000 page IRS. Let's start with amendment number one, freedom of speech. Can I uh, talk about where Patrick lives and why we should kill him. Well, no, but isn't that freedom of speech? Can I give out enemy uh, secrets to the enemy during wartime? Is that freedom of speech? Can I yell fire in a crowded theater? Which, by the way, I, I think I've told this, uh, we used to do in middle school, and it was so fun because nothing would ever happen. So this idea that we need to regulate speech or people would scream fire, we do it all the time because we were conservatives just trying to push the limits a little and nothing ever happened. So it, it again is just telling you, watch out for this terrible thing that everyone looked at us and just said, Oh, idiots. So, uh, okay. So those three things that come to mind, Julian Assange, there are people who say he should be tried for war crimes, even though he just used his speech. It, it's not of laws. It's always of men. It depends on what motivates the men and under which system they have justified powers. And so uh, I, I think uh, not understanding that is what gives the state a lot of its power. It's important to just recognize it. This is laws of people who have come to their decisions, and then we can start criticizing them, but we have to recognize the reality. It's not this, you know, platonic ideal that's just objectively imposed. It's a judge's interpretation. The Second Amendment, th those are just the first two amendments. Mm -hmm. Think about all the laws ever. So, yeah, uh, uh, that that is what's loosely referred to as the myth of the rule of law by John Hasness. Well, maybe I'm, I'm. I think what I'm trying to do is ascribe the the most generous position to Justice Scalia, which would be that there's this idea of um, that the law is objective, and we should be a nation based on this objective law or the NAP, and not a nation of men. Something that's ruled, you know, by the tyranny of the majority or by popular opinion and yeah so justice a note on justice scalia is in 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 law school when we were in our uh constitutional law classes and all those everyone hated justice scalia but i thought at the same time some of them respected him you know they always there was some kind of a respect there for his opinions and for his wit and for, you know, his colorful opinions. And I don't know if that's going to exist anymore. I don't know if that was like a real kind of respect, like a mutual disagreement respect or a hatred. I, I, I can't be too sure. Dude, mutual disagreements. I mean, uh, when they were just talking about Scalia getting voted 98 to nothing, I don't see any judge anytime soon getting a, yeah. you know, vast majority to zero sort of thing that Elena Kagan got, Sonia Sotomayor got after Kavanaugh now with, uh, you know, Ginsburg leaving. That's uh, that's not going to happen. This is very related. She says Scalia taught me more than just law. He was devoted to his family. 
resolute in his beliefs and fearless of criticism. As I embarked on my own legal career, I resolved to maintain that same perspective. There is a tendency in our profession to treat the practice of law as all-consuming while losing sight of everything else, but that makes for a shallow and unfulfilling life. I worked hard as a lawyer and as a professor. I owed that to my clients, my students, and myself, but I never let the law define my identity or crowd out the rest of my life. Showing a little bit of depth, that's kind of nice. Thoughts on that? It's a balance, and it's a very real balance. There, She's not kidding when she says that the practice of law really starts to become all-encompassing. I mean, and what you really need, you know, as in with every professional field and every, I mean, blue-collar jobs and everything too, you, you need a mentor. You need someone who's going to take you under their wing and show you the ropes. And that can be the difference between a successful career and an unsuccessful career. Um, but you got to have that balance and, you know, the audience and, and everyone, you only really see a small sliver of what it's like, at least for me. And I've tried to take with my show, I've tried to take the audience on the journey with me. Um, and so I hope that people who have been listening to the show for quite a, a long time have been able to kind of see that. Uh, but it is a struggle. It's a real struggle to to live both lives. Well, you know, all your different lives. But it, it is very easy. I mean, there's so much damn work that goes with it. And, and getting so emotionally, you're not supposed to get emotionally attached to your cases and your clients, but you do. You know, and it when you lose, it eats a small little part of you, you know. <laughs> And I, I think she maybe you're going to talk about this, but I, th I think she mentions it that um, try having these feelings when when she's reading cases, she tries to picture herself as each one of the litigants and see how her decision is going to affect them, because for them, every single case is the most important case of their life. So that's a lot of weight <laughs> to put on your shoulders. Barrett continues a similar principle applies to the role of courts. Courts have a vital responsibility to enforce the rule of law, which is critical to a free society. But courts are not designed to solve every problem or right every wrong in our public life. The policy decisions and value judgments of government must be made by the political branches elected by and accountable to the people. The public should not expect courts to do so, and courts should not try. Anything of value there? I think that in a libertarian system, we wouldn't have to deal with this whole separation of powers issue. Maybe that's wishful thinking, but I think um, over over this summer, it's become very apparent exactly how tyrannical the rule of the mob can be in this lawlessness, not only on the side of the mob rule, but also on the side of the police, which, okay, <laughs> you know, potato, potato. But at the same time, when the police don't abide by the law and Tim pool said something about this with these Antifa uh, rioters in Portland that were just surrounded because they got snitched on. Um, and so they were surrounded, but there's a video of it and you can see the police talking about a, a temporary restraining order that was put in by the city government. And he said, I don't give two F's about this TRO. So, on one hand, you have the rule of the mob, the literal mob, and you then you have the rule of the organized mob, and neither of them care about the rule of law. Um, so when we get into this talk about dropping the anarchy word, and we try and make that distinction between, no, it, it doesn't mean no rules, because that would be something without the rule of law. And I think that's real tyranny. Yeah, there is a great book written by, I think he's a lawyer, uh, Randy Barnett, called The Structure of Liberty. The best part about it is there's a summary at the end of each chapter. So it takes 10 minutes to reread the summaries, and then you get the whole book. He really makes a great case that there is a legal reasoning behind um, – having a society without a state, which there's still law. As I mentioned with uh, that Stefan Kinsella, it, he has a new book coming out, which you got to have him on to talk about. Law in a Libertarian World, I think it's going to be called. Um, but him and I were talking about it, and he just explains what law is in a society and says, by the way, 
uh, usually a group comes along and tries to monopolize this, and that's what the state is. So it's like th- there is no real intrinsic the state and the law. It's just one of the things they try to monopolize, like you know they try to do with healthcare or um, or anything else. She goes on. Um, that is the approach I have strived to follow as a judge on the Seventh Circuit. In every case, I have carefully considered the arguments presented by the parties, discussed the issues with my colleagues on the court, and done my utmost to reach the result required by law, whatever my own personal preference may be. I don't like that she kind of constantly goes back to this. Um, uh, that there's no objective rule. There's just that which is. And she kind of bends over to that tyranny. I that, that's a little uh, that's a little disappointing. I try to remain mindful that while my court decides thousands of cases each year, each case is the most important one to the parties involved. After all, cases are not like statutes, which are often named for their authors. Cases are named for the parties who stand to gain or lose in the real world, often through their liberty or livelihood. Thoughts on that uh, paragraph. Yeah, it's pretty hard. I mean, when you when you're a litigant, it, your case really is the most important thing going on in your life. You try, you know, to set it to the side, but oftentimes it goes on for years, at least in the civil system. You know, maybe in a criminal system it goes for a year and a half. Um, but do you do you want to elaborate a bit? Can you read that section over again where she talks about there no there not being an objective answer? What she specifically said was, I I mean, she sort of bends it on and off. In every case, I've carefully considered the arguments presented by the parties, discussed the issue with my colleagues on the court, and done my utmost to reach the result required by the law, whatever my own personal preferences might be. So that to me, when you say preferences, Mm -hmm. it's it's a lot uh, different to say, you know, I have a preference for Olive Garden as opposed to TGI Friday's. But uh, when you're talking about, you know, enslaving people, starting wars that kill people, sanctioning countries that kill civilians, I feel like there should be an elevated uh, uh, an elevated importance of this is right and this is wrong, especially if you're supposed to be one of the greatest minds that holds such a high seat in uh, such, you know, an important country like uh, America. I think this is where libertarians, where libertarian jurists differ with conservative jurists then, because as if you're a conservative jurist, okay, well, there's a super unjust result, but it's the law, so I have to apply it that way. Whereas, you know, we would, we would say, you know, if, if it's morally incorrect, it's illegal according to the NAP, you know, that's my guide. Maybe the guiding stars are different. You know what I mean? They they are, but uh, the conservative is caught in a contradiction. Mm-hmm. If the American Revolution was illegal, then their moral justification for what the law is is illegal. So they're in the contradiction of, well, you violently overthrew this government illegally. Mm-hmm. So anything it does is not legitimate. You need to abide by, you know, the previous legislature. So what they're really saying is this is what's generally accepted to be. That's what I'm going to continue to do. Now, there are some cases where that's true. I'm trying to think of a meeting of the minds case. So that would be a meeting of the minds. You go to uh, the bar and, you know, you get uh, uh, you just ask for two beers and then ask for the bill. And they say that'll be nine million dollars. Well, no, because I've been here before. I know it's like between seven and nine dollars a beer the, even though i didn't specify we have a general understanding because there's always room for more fine print of well uh, you basically um you sat here for a long time and now we're going to charge you rent because that counts as renting out this booth uh you never asked us if there was a fee there is a general tendency to have an understanding just because it's efficient. The The cost is too high to, you know, agree on every single little thing. So you uh, end up having those. And that would be a case of, well, what's the custom in this culture? All right. Then you should have expected that you have to tell them if something is going to be a million dollars for a drink, because there are wines that are like a hundred thousand. So it's possible, right. but you have to let them know again, the existence of, 
you know, having clear contracts in no way justifies a monopoly state. Mm -hmm. Barrett continues, when I write an opinion resolving a case, I read every word from the perspective of the losing party. I ask myself, how would I view the decision if one of my children was the party I was ruling against, even though I would not like the result would I understand that the decision was fairly reasoned and grounded in the law? That is the standard I set for myself in every case, and it is the standard I will follow as long as I am judge on any court. That's pretty much the last thing I had highlighted. Thoughts on that final statement? She has a lot of faith in litigants, <laughs> thinking that they're going to calmly and rationally think through the court's decision-making process. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... You know, I've I've already had an appeal that went to the appeals court and I lost. And uh, I thought for sure that I was going to win. But, you know, I guess I calmly and rationally thought through their arguments and could understand why I didn't win. But, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I, I was thinking about there's Amy Coney Barrett, as far as I know. I don't know if she ever was a, a trial court judge. Because the difference between, I don't want to go off too far here, but the difference between a trial court and an appeals court is that the trial court is supposed to find the facts. So they try to determine what happened. And it's often said that trial courts have a lot of discretion to make certain calls. There's, it's just the nature of the trial court. And I think that if you're in a if you're in an appeals court, I think you you have less discretion and it seems like there's maybe more of what an objective answer would be, but it seems like, you know, my problem with the appeals court and the supreme court, or at least the supreme court, is that they they just seem to make up law. You know, they just make it up out of nowhere and can justify it afterwards. You can come to a certain decision and then justify it legally afterwards. And anyone can do that because they're damn smart, you know, insidious, but smart. Definitely. So that, uh, uh is, uh, basically the remainder. I did highlight the fact that Sandra Day O'Connor was the, uh, first woman on, uh, the, the court, which I totally forget about that, you know, cause RBG is really seen as, uh, the one who gets all the attention for, uh, you know, really representing women and opening up, uh, you know, a pathway for women in the legal profession. That just goes to show you how married people are to the cultural aspect of things. And that's something that, uh, you know, we certainly, of course, while, you know, we still have a division of labor within the freedom movement, let's specialize in our things. We got to realize that you can totally erase the fact that, you know, Republicans appointed a black guy on the Supreme Court, they appointed, uh, you know, the the first woman, higher percentage of Republicans voted uh, for the Civil Rights Act. Uh, they were against uh, the enslavement of blacks from the foundation of their party, and they're seen as racist. What? That's the racist party in America. So, you know, the... Hey, do I got you? Hey, you, you got me now. Okay. I was just saying it's, it's incredible uh, how the narrative is controlled when the reality is so far from the truth. That's mm -hmm. all I got for you. Uh, always good to talk to you, Pat. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you uh, plug where the listeners can find your content? One place that I would ask them, of, uh, I am on YouTube, so uh, please uh, subscribe there. I know it's very easy. If you could please subscribe to my library, Minds, and Bitute accounts, just to know that there's a soft place to land on if I get banned from YouTube. I was actually flagged again the other day for something. So I don't know what the strike policy is. I think they're just doing takedowns without permanent strikes. Either way, I'm on thin ice. People are getting banned constantly all the time. Adam Kokesh was just banned. So uh, I would greatly appreciate if people subbed to me uh, on the alternative channels. All right. Yeah. And I'll put links in the show notes page, libertyweekly.net forward slash 134. So I think that's everything that we got for you. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Peace.